Okay, hi everyone. This is National Master Dennis Montecrucis, and this week I'm going to present another one of my games. And this is a, an older game from 2002, and it's against Leonid Yudasin from the New York Masters tournaments that Greg Shahadi used to run way back when. And actually, it's very interesting about this game. I didn't even intend to play. I was actually, I had I'd lived in the area until the previous year, and I was uh, doing a summer camp on Long Island and visiting a friend there. And I thought, well, you know, I'll check out one of these New York, New York Masters tournaments just to watch. I mean, I was, felt like I was too tired to play. I hadn't really been playing very much at that point in, in my life. I'd kind of uh, gotten back into academia and wasn't really, wasn't really working on my own chess at all. So this was just supposed to be recreation, no intention of playing. Just thought I'd watch all the, uh, all the strong players in action and see what they did. As it turns out, though, um, Greg needed a player, so they, were, they had uh, an odd number of players, so I was um, recruited to be a filler. And, you know, I was, was certainly not optimistic about this at all. I thought, hey, you know, I'm going to be a, a, free point, a full point buy for somebody, really. And when I was paired with Udasin at first, you know, I thought, this is, you know, absolutely horrible. This is even worse. So, I, you know, not only am I um, going to be playing a very strong player, but I'm probably playing the best player in the tournament. So Udasin was winning almost all of the, uh, almost every week in, in this event. So a very strong player. In fact, he was a candidate back in the, um, in the mid-90s and lost a match to, to Kramnik. So super strong guy. And, you know, here I am. I'm tired. I just worked the full day. Um, you know, no intention of playing, out of form, all of that stuff. And, and I even got black, too, to boot. So, you know, everything was just perfectly against me in this, in this event. But, you know, after this sort of initial negative reaction, I thought, well, you know, I've got nothing to lose. I mean, if I lose the game, what am I going to lose? One point, two, two rating points, big deal. So, you know, I'll just have some fun, see what I can do, try my best, and, um, you know, if I lose, I was expected to lose. It's basically free of charge. I don't have to play to, I don't have to pay to play. And, um, you know, what, what the heck? Let's see what, see what we can do. So, uh, it turns out this was the only game. So after this, someone else showed up. But I got my one filler game in, and it turns out that it, it ended not only successfully, but it also ended with um, a really incredible incredible finish. So very, very amusing and entertaining, and uh, definitely picturesque. All right, well, let's have a look at the game, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it, too. Okay, so I had black, and I played the Schliemann defense. So this was a mainstay of my repertoire for, for many years. I'll still trot it out every once in a while, but, but not too often. It's, uh, it has its problems, I think. Uh, I know where the dead bodies are buried. And while I, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, it's not, not in the category of, let's say, the Latvian Gambit, which is practically a forced loss, uh, it's still not very good. I mean, black is, is still, well, maybe never clearly worse, but there are quite a few lines where black has just about no winning chances and can uh, only fight for a draw. Um, but it, it is playable, I think. So it's it's not 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 catastrophically bad. It's it's um, it's okay. And of course, at amateur level, I mean, if your opponent isn't well prepared, doesn't have one line really deeply understood, then it's it's perfectly fine. I mean, my my record against this when I was um, below 2,000 was fantastic. Even when I was playing people who were who were higher rated. So um, definitely not a bad not a bad opening, but. I wouldn't recommend making it the uh, the main part of your of your repertoire. All right, well here the main move is knight to c3, but almost no one seems to play this anymore. Uh, everyone is now infatuated with d3, and that's in fact what what Yudasin played against me. Okay, so f takes e4, d takes e4, knight f6, castles, bishop c5, and here um, nowadays the queen of d3 is just all the rage. I mean everyone's playing this. And it's been promoted in a bunch of repertoire books. And um, it was also played just this last week, twice, in the, um, in the uh, Linares tournament. So uh, both Topalov and then Carlson in the last round against Rajabov used this, this move. And, and this variation goes like this. So first of all, uh, the threat, or the point of this move, is that if black castles, big blunder, white plays queen to c4 check, and thanks black for a very pleasant and short game. So d6 is the move protecting the, uh, the bishop. White plays queen to c4, preventing castling. Queen e7, now knight to c3. So white would like to um, just pile up here, play maybe bishop to g5, and then knight to d5. So black, black's best is probably bishop to d7 here. Bishop e6 just walks in a knight to d5 immediately. 
Okay, so white now plays knight to d5, and we get a, a bunch of trades, but the result is a position where white has a, a small but nagging edge. And this is the kind of quasi-ending that we, we got to in the, uh, the aforementioned Rajabov games. Now here, white plays a4, which is a good move. The point is that he now threatens to Noah's Ark black's bishop with c3, followed by a5 and or b4, whatever he's got to do to trap the bishop. So black plays a6, but now it loosens up his queenside a little bit. And that's important because black is going to castle long. Bishop to e3. Here black more or less is forced to, to play, uh, to, to capture on e3, since bishop to a7 is kind of bad, and the other retreats are even worse. So takes. Now it's illegal for black to castle long, of course. Or uh, castle short, excuse me. So he has to castle long. And now white has tried three different moves here. Um, B4 was the original recommendation, I believe, and I think Greet, uh, Andrew Greet recommends this in his book, his repertoire book on the Ruy Lopez. Uh, it looks as if Black has managed to to survive this direct attacking idea. So the uh, the subsequent ideas have involved moving the rook from F1 up, so either to F3, or as was played a couple of times, as I said in, in Linares, rook to F2, and. Um, in both of those games, I believe the continuation was, uh, I think, rook d to f8, rook a to f1, takes, takes, queen e7, and then queen to e4. And this prevents, of course, black from challenging on the on the f-file because the, the g6 pawn, or sorry, the h pawn, excuse me, is going to hang. So if rook f8, then queen takes h7, or rook takes f8 first and then queen takes h7. Now, black can try various expedients to, to take care of this, but white's idea is to follow up with queen to f3. And that's why rook to f2 is perhaps a little bit more accurate than rook to f3, namely it allows this doubling operation. So black gets a little bit of counterplay, um, typically bring the queen to, to g5 or to h4 once white plays queen f3. And always keep this threat of penetrating hanging over um, white's head. So it's, uh, again, white has the better position, is the one who can, can make the, uh, the attempt to win, and black has to try to react, and often with some kind of combination of, of passive and active defense. Um, you can take a look at, again, take a look at those games from, from Linares. Uh, I commented on them a little bit on my blog, which is at chessmind.powerblogs.com, but you can find, the, find um, those games many places. Okay, in any case, white has, as I said, a small but nagging edge in these variations. But I think this, this whole plan is getting worked out as of, of relatively recent vintage, maybe the last two, three years or so. And back in 2002, I don't think it was, was really well known. So the, the idea of queen of d3 or queen of e2 was known, but it, it was more of a kind of a cheapo idea involving um, various tactics trying to exploit the bishop on c5 as this, this positional plan to reach this endgame, I don't believe it was known at that point. All right, so Yudasin played what was then the main move, knight to c3. I played d6, bishop g5, castles, knight to d5. And this looks a bit threatening, because black's pawn structure on the, on the king side is going to be uh, loosened up here. Now, I think I just misremembered at this point what I was supposed to play. Again, rust, and, and I think I had also... I was moving on to other variations in the opening besides the Schliemann, but as I wasn't really, uh, I didn't think that they were exactly in tournament condition at that point, I went back to the, to the old standard here. But um, anyway, so the point is that I, I misremembered what I was supposed to play here. The theoretical move in this position is king to h8. And now um, the point is, or one point of this is that black won't lose the exchange if white plays knight takes f6. So g takes f6, bishop h6, rook to g8, bishop c4, and no problem, the rook can come up. So there's um, the rook won't be trapped there. So there's two two normal moves here. I think the um, a sideline, another sideline is to play c3. The idea of this is twofold, to, to play b4, and also to prevent things like bishop to g4 followed by knight to d4. So that's that idea is kind of shut down. But black can maybe play knight to e7, and after the swap again, black seems to be in pretty good shape here. So the rook is well placed on the g-file, his king is safe, and he's going to have a very big center. In some ways, uh, I should point this out now, and, and this will be a recurring theme for quite a while in the opening, 
there are some broad family resemblances between this and the Sveshnikov Sicilian, which we discussed a little bit last week, in that um, White has the opportunity to take advantage of some holes. Now, in this case, it's more f5 than e5 than d5. Pardon me, that's vulnerable. But here, black is, I think, pretty well set up. We'll see some other lines where it's it's not not as clear. The other kind of resemblance is that black has this big pawn center, and also we could note the uh, the open g file too, which happens in um, some of the variations of the Sveshnikov. So we've got that as kind of our our battle here. Now this, I think, is a particularly favorable position for black, but we'll see other cases where white's the one with the nagging edge. All right, uh, instead of c3 or um, knight takes f6, knight to h4 is, is the more sensible move, avoiding any bishop to g4 pinning ideas and already starting to aim at the f5 square. And you can notice the knight on d5, too, another Sveshnikov-like um, feature. Okay, well, here black plays knight to d4, and this lets us see why c3 was an attractive move. And now there's kind of a funny, uh, let's give the main line and just note, but without really going into details, about the uh, the funny two-step maneuvers that both sides make. So here, white doesn't play bishop to d3 straight away, but plays bishop to c4, and only after b5 plays bishop to d3. Of course, the idea is to make this pawn on b5 a little bit of a target, and to try to show that black will is, is slightly overextended over on the queen side later on. Okay, black plays c6, takes, takes, bishop b3, rook g8, and now another kind of uh, funny maneuver. So king to h8, this, this makes sense, getting off the g file and out of the way of tricks like uh, bishop to g4, maybe knight to f3 at some point. <coughs> so rook to g4, okay, white plays g3, and now black plays rook to g8. This one is a, lo a lot easier to grasp by, by inducing g3. Now um, f3, h3, g4 are all a, a good, good deal weaker than they were. So f3, bishop h3, rook to g1. This has all been played before. Knight to e6, bishop takes c5. Okay, I'm not sure if that's been played before, but it's given in the, uh, the important book on the Schliemann by V.L. Ivanov and Kooligan. So it's, a, it's, I don't know, from the mid-90s, I think, but it was by far and away the best book written on the Schliemann. Okay, so knight takes c5, queen at e2, and here they claim that white is slightly better, but I think after bishop to e6, the position is in fact equal. So this would be the, um, the main line here, and it looks like black is all right. Now, there are other tries, too. And again, as I said, the, uh, the important move is queen of d3 right now. Or queen e2. They'll probably transpose. So this, this will probably come to the same thing in most of the cases. All right, but if white plays knight to c3, d6, bishop g5, castles, knight to d5, king h8 is correct. Okay, in my game, I played bishop to g4. And I missed something important here. So after knight takes f6, which Udasin didn't play, g takes f6, bishop h6. So I thought I could just play rook to e8. All right, and so after bishop c4, king h8, bishop to f7, I thought, well, okay, I'm sorry, uh, bishop to f7, there's no problem on account of knight to d4. And this, this looks kind of, uh, kind of frisky here. Black gets some compensation for the, um, for the exchange. I don't know if it's enough probably isn't, but it's, it's at least a little something. But white has a very strong move, which is knight to g5. So a kind of a remarkable idea, but very powerful. All right, if f takes g5, queen takes g4, and, and black is just positionally lost here. And uh, he's also losing the g-pawn, too, for no real compensation. So the better move, um, okay, and bishop takes d1. This is not any good because of knight to f7 check, king to g8, knight takes d8, which is check, and after king to h8, um, maybe we can do a little windmill here with knight f7 check. Yeah, we might as well do that. And then take this one, and then, okay, I mean, we can keep having some fun here. Knight to f7, king g8, knight d6. <laughs> All right, and this is just, you know, co completely disemboweling black here. And white's obviously just dead one. He's, uh, he's a rook ahead and uh, a couple of pawns, too. So the better move is to play queen to d7 back here. After knight to g5, queen d7, 
But this is losing two, or at least clearly worse. So white gets a, a free pawn for nothing here. So again, we take advantage of this windmill. And here, again, white's just essentially up a pawn for, for nothing. So uh, maybe it's, it's not resignable, but it's also very unappealing for black. All right, so knight to g5 is, is a terrific move. Um, instead of rook to e8, black might be able to try knight to d4. But this, um, this doesn't really quite pan out if black plays, if white plays accurately. Now, bishop to c4 isn't as good, strangely enough. So this is what we just looked at, actually. King h8, bishop takes, knight takes, pawn takes, bishop h3. And here white's better, but needs to play accurately. If he tries bishop to h6, looks plausible, you save your material, this loses. And see if you can figure out how black wins in this position. So here's our, our first stop the tape moment. Okay, so I hope you saw that the winning move here for black is queen to g8 check. Of course, this loses the queen, but that's trumped by giving checkmate. So king here, it doesn't matter if white throws the bishop in the way or not. Bishop takes f3, and it's mate next move. Okay, so um, that's a, a kind of a fun line, but white can play even better with bishop takes f8. And here, black is just losing. Uh, this position, again, looks kind of attractive, but the problem is if he plays queen takes f8, white just plays bishop to e2, saves his material, breaks the pin, and he's simply the exchange ahead for nothing. So we should try knight takes b5 with the hope that after the bishop retreats, we play knight to d4, and maybe we're getting a little, little bit of counterplay. Unfortunately, it turns out that white can use the g-file just as well as black can. So c3, takes and takes. And now if bishop to h3, white just does a little sidestep here. King to h1, threatening rook to g1 check, which would be winning. And after bishop takes f1, not queen takes f1, but queen to d5 check. And black is just getting mated here. And what does he do about the threat of simply queen to g7? If he plays queen to g8, then queen takes f6, is mate next move. And if he tries the little trick, bishop to g2 check, with the idea of king takes bishop, queen to g8 check, and now black swaps the queens and is equal. Instead, white just ignores it and plays king to g1, and now it's a forced mate. Okay, so this is um, one unhappy ending for me. And if I try instead bishop to h5, well, this didn't come up, but if the position occurred and I tried bishop to h5, then again, white plays king to h1, and he's simply going to be the exchange ahead and winning. So knight takes f6 after bishop to g4 was correct. So there were some difficult tactics to, to calculate all the way through, especially in a, a game 30 situation, but it is objectively the best. So he played bishop to e2, and, and now I have a second chance. All right, now his idea is actually a pretty good one. What, what white is hoping to do is to swap off on f6, play knight to h4, and end up in a position where he's got this beautiful and unassailable knight on f5 against um, just this dark squared bishop, which can't really contest it. Now, it turns out that I can fight against this plan in two different ways. So in some cases, I can fight against it by just making sure that he can't achieve it. And the second way is by, by achieving some kind of sufficient compensation uh, in return for him getting the good knight versus, if not bad, then slightly um, not, not as good bishop. <laughs> All right. So let's see what I could have done. So bishop to e6 is an attempt to avoid the trade of light squared bishops, at least the trade of my light squared bishop for his light squared bishop. If I can destroy his knights, then I'm okay. All right, so bishop takes f6, the thematic, again, we could say kind of a quasi sveshnikov move. g takes f5. And here, I think um, white has a couple of tries, but neither of which really leads to any, any concrete advantage. If he plays c3, we'll see why he might play c3. Then I think I just play f5, and I'm okay. So it's, a, it's just a good battle here. Maybe white has a small advantage, but it's nothing serious. My king is, is perfectly safe, at least for the foreseeable future. And I, I have a, a nice pawn majority in the center 
to compensate for his, his nice knight. All right, if instead of c3, white plays knight to h4, aiming at something like bishop to g4, trying to swap off the light squared bishops, and again, then put the knight on f5, well, here I should play knight to d4. And if white plays bishop to g4 here, consistent with his strategic um, plan, then I would take on d5 and then play f5. So here I'm just in time. I get f5 in before he can play c3 and kick my knight off. And of course here it's just very strong because I'm hitting the, uh, the bishop and the queen. So it's, uh, it's tactically justified as well. So white doesn't have time for bishop to g4 and needs to play knight to e3. And again, what, what he's hoping to play is still bishop to g4, make the swap, play c3, and get the knight embedded on f5. Again, though, I'm in time to get good play. So knight takes e2, king to h8, and now rook to g8. And so even though he's achieved his, his nice knight, I can pretty much eliminate it at will. I mean, I can play bishop takes e3 if I want. And if he doesn't take back with the knight, I can take on f5, should I so desire. And if he does take with the knight, then if the knight makes a return trip to f5, again, I can eliminate it. I've also got, again, my nice center. I've got the bishop here. I've got the g file. So there's a lot of things I can play to, to try to get some counterplay. So I could go for c6 and d5. Might be one idea. I could strive to, to double or triple even in some circumstances on the g file. So it's a, it's a roughly equal position, I think. White has a beautiful knight, no doubt about it, and very good control over f5 in general. But black does have, have um, his assets as well. OK, unfortunately, instead of this, I played a less sophisticated but quite natural move, queen of d7. So I simply wanted to break the pin and try to, uh, to build up a kingside attack rather naively. OK, he plays bishop takes f6, g takes f6. And here the move, which of course is part and parcel of the plan as I very well recognize now, but was pretty much oblivious to at the time, was knight h4. And now all of a sudden, I, uh, I felt a lot less happy. Uh, incidentally, I should point out that the, uh, the stem game, at least for this plan, was played between Halifman, the um, one-time FIDE world champion, and the Bulgarian Grandmaster Inkyov. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but um, you can find it. And uh, again, he introduced this plan, and I think it was quite a, it's, it is quite a dangerous one, quite a logical plan for white. All right, well here, instead of bishop takes e2, which I played, perhaps the, um, the better idea is again to preserve this bishop from exchange with bishop to e6. Black could play, or white can play c3, again, keeping my knight off of d4 and also preparing some expansion with b4 and a4 in some cases. Knight e7, takes, takes, bishop g4. So here we see the plan in a kind of an ideal um, presentation. But even so, I think black is pretty much OK. So we swap, knight f5. And here, probably the best move is rook f to d8. And, and I think white does have an edge in this position. So his knight is definitely better than my bishop. And I might have some trouble getting in c6 and d5. But if I, if I can achieve c6 and d5, and nothing really kind of bad has happened to me in the meantime, then I think I'm in, I'm in good shape. So um, white is a little bit better, but black's position is playable. All right, instead I swapped on e2, and I think this is a, a little bit inferior. Queen takes e2. And now, for example, if I play knight to e7, here he swaps, again plays knight to f5, and Again, I think this is a better version of it because I'm going to have a tougher time getting in d5. So he's just a little bit faster here than um, in some of the other cases. OK. So I didn't play knight to, um, to e7, though. And I was, of course, at this point, fully aware of his plan. And I came up with an interesting but tactically wrong-headed way of, of uh, trying to, well, of, of trying to combat his strategic plan. So I played knight to d4 here. And now in this position, I was actually worried about queen to c4, which he didn't play, but maybe should have. After king to h8, c3, knight e6, b4, I think he, he obtained some advantage. Um, c6 is probably not very good because b takes c5, so bishop to b6 is best. And here, I think if he plays rook a to d1, he's maybe got a small advantage still. So it's a, it's a more comfortable position for white. The problem for black is that while I'd like to play c6, to do so would make this, this pawn on d6 
quite vulnerable. So um, I don't want to do it, but if I don't do it, then knight on d5 is a real, a real thorn in the flesh. And he's also threatening to play a4, which I don't want to stop with a5 or a6, because then, if, if a5, then again he plays knight takes b6, c takes b6, and the pawn on d6 is weakened once again. I'll have a little counterplay against his c3 pawn, but white, white is preferable. White's position is preferable. Okay, so all this to say that queen to c4, I think, gives white some advantage. But he played queen to d1, and this is quite consistent. He wants to play c3, knight f5, and so on. Now here, though, I could have played c6, and in this case, I think I get the best version of the uh, good knight versus bishop um, middle game that we've seen. So knight e3, rook a to d8. Here, if you play c3, I play knight e6, and that's fine for me. So let's say he plays knight h to f5, takes, takes, d5. And here, black is in very good shape. So white's got the knight on f5, but that's about all he's got. So all of my pieces are very well mobilized. Um, I'm threatening his e-pawn. If he allows me to take or push the d-pawn, also his a2-pawn might be hanging in some cases. So um, as good as his knight on f5 is, here I think black is fully equal. So this would have been... Uh, this would have been sufficient. I was, I think, too worried about his knight on f5, and so because of that, I avoided variations like this and played f5. And I just wanted to sacrifice the exchange if, if uh, I had to, or sacrifice a piece for a couple of pawns, get some play, but not give his knight that f5 square. Unfortunately, what I missed, and what also fortunately, um, or sorry, unfortunately I missed it. Fortunately, Udasin saw it, but underestimated it, or overestimated his choice in the game. White well, could have played a very good move here, b4. So this is crucially different from what happens in the game. Okay, here I have a choice. I can either play bishop to b6, in which case white now plays c3 with the key difference that after f takes e4, knight takes b6, a takes b6, c to d4, um, I can only take back on d4 with the pawn, and it's not protected. See, in the game, as you'll see, I'm able to play bishop takes d4. So in the game, there is c3, f takes e4, c takes d4, bishop d4. And this just makes a world of difference. So now I've got two very safe pawns, and they're very good pawns. This this pawn center I've got is, is quite nice. It's a little fist I've got in the center, and it's a, it's a mobile fist as well. So it's going to come, come all the way down and, and sock white. All right, so um, here, too, white could have played b4. And, uh, and I think this would have also been strong for him. So c6, b c, c d, c d, e d, c d. So all these captures. A bunch of c d's and e d's. Uh, and now d3. So here I'm going to pick up his d6 pawn, but I probably don't have enough. So I'm, you know, white's probably objectively winning, but it at least is not a, a trivial win by any means. So I can still put up resistance, but. This, this just isn't nearly as good as what I get in the game, as you'll see. All right, so going back a bit, though. So b4 would put me in trouble, as we saw, the, um, the bishop to b6 line, c3. This just isn't, as, and it, this isn't good at all for me. I'm just losing here. Uh, I can try c6, which is a little bit trickier, but he takes the bishop, and now he plays c3. And while I can kind of wriggle a bit here, it looks like I, I'm in, in some trouble no matter what. All right, so if I try to go for, again, this kind of uh, central pawn fist, it just doesn't work out really as well. Um, I have some compensation, but, but not enough here. If I play e takes d4, again, some compensation, but probably not enough. There's too many open lines here. That's, that's kind of the problem. But, it's, you know, this is the kind of thing that I would have done, would have had to do, and just see what would have happened. Okay, um, also, there's simply knight to e6. All right, and I have a duplicate line here for no obvious reason in my notes. Okay, so queen takes, f takes, c takes d6, and um, this position is also not so good for me. So I haven't lost a piece this time, but I've got a bunch of weak pawns, and his pawn on d6 is pretty good. So I could try this, queen e4. Queen d6, knight f5, and white seems to be just winning. He's up a pawn, 
and I've got um, a weakness on b7, a weakness on e5, and my king's position is a bit exposed too. So all the way around, it's uh, it's kind of unpleasant. Okay, uh, something else I could try instead. All right, or something else he could try instead is uh, queen takes e5. So after rook a to c8, queen takes e5 is also possible, and this might even be better. So queen e5, knight f4, queen takes e4, queen to g4, and um, while this looks kind of threatening, in fact it just doesn't really quite pan out. King to h1, avoiding the uh, this, the discovery, so you can see black threatening knight to h3 check, and then queen takes e4. So king h1 just sidesteps it, queen takes h4, g3, and while after queen of d8, g takes f4, all of white's pawns are isolated here. So all, all six of them. The problem is that white has six isolated pawns and black has just three pawns total. So it's, uh, it's enough to win. Queen d6, queen b7. And unfortunately for black, he doesn't have time to go grabbing more pawns because of the threat of rook to g1 check and then queen to, um, to g7 mate. So white, white is winning in this position. All right, so instead, as I mentioned, white should have played b4. This would have been a good move, but he played c3 instead. Actually, let me fix one other thing here. Okay, so uh, he played c3, and after f takes e4, again, he should have played b4. This would have been best, but he played c takes d4. And now we end up with this very, very interesting position. So queen to e2, threatening my e-pawn, and if I were losing it, the game would simply be over, but c6, knight e3, d5, and black has very real compensation here in the form of, again, this, this massive pawn center here. And don't forget this c-pawn, too. This, this may come in, into the game. So what we've essentially got is uh, a, a real battle of imbalances here. As long as I can keep these, these pawns intact, and, and nice and strong, and maybe advance them carefully, then I'm okay, because they're, first of all, clocking up an awful lot of space, so it's keeping his rooks out of the game. His, uh, his knights are okay, but they don't, I've got enough squares covered on the light, on, uh, sorry, I've got enough kingside light squares covered that I don't really have to worry about getting mated either. Plus, my bishop on d4 is very good, too. So um, this is not, not an easy task for white to, to convert his, his small material advantage. All right, so he plays rook a to d1. I played king to h8, just getting off the uh, the g file. b3, rook f6. So I'm just going to double up and, and maybe play rook to h6 in some position. Okay, but maybe this was slightly inaccurate because now he plays knight to c2. And the point is that I can't move my bishop now because queen takes e4. So I allowed this pin. So unfortunately, unfortunately, I have to give up my, my dark squared bishop, this beautiful piece. But nevertheless, um, there are quite a number of pawns that are going to be very happy, ready, willing, and eager to take its place on, on the d4 square. So c5, g3. Of course, I still can't move the bishop because of queen takes e4. So now I play queen to f7, piling up on the f file, on the f file and uh, also now threatening to save my bishop. So he takes it. I take and now he plays f4. Now, this, this move definitely has a couple of points in its favor. So first of all, he no longer has to worry about pressure against f2. And he's now got a mobile kingside majority as well. And he's grabbing some space on the kingside. And also, it's not clear what my, my heavy pieces are doing on the f-file any longer. On the other hand, now my pawn on e4 is completely safe. And it's just one more passed pawn. So I went from essentially having one passed pawn, or two, but they were doubled, to now having three passed pawns with the possibility of even more yet to come. Okay, so here I played rook to e8, just bringing my last piece into play, and of course, I want to help these uh, these guys go forward. So I'd like to play d3, and if he plays queen to e3, to play d4, and then play e3, and just keep, keep them trundling down the board as fast as possible. All right, so now he plays rook f to e1, which stops d3, because... Were I to play this, rook takes d3 would be very embarrassing and, and painful. And we would miss the wonderful conclusion to this game as well. All right, so I played rook f to e6, renewing the threat of d3. 
at least the possibility of d3. He plays f5, rook to e5, and now queen to f2. So once again, he's preventing d3 because the, uh, the c-pawn would hang. So if I push, queen takes c5, and then I would be clearly lost. All right, so I play queen to f6, preventing him from playing f5, f6 himself. So I, I don't want to allow his, uh, his, his uh, pawns to get moving. Even if they're not as impressive as a force as my central pawns are, still, um, I don't want to give white any unnecessary counterplay. All right, so now he played h3, just slowly preparing his kingside advance. Uh, he'd like to play king to h2 before playing g4, so there's uh, going to be fewer tactical possibilities against his king. All right, so now I played b6, preparing to play d3. He played g4. And now here, maybe I could play, I should play d3. It's, it's not so clear. So I, I didn't like that, it seemed, for, it seemed to me that, for, at least for a moment, my, um, the dark squares might be blockadable. So knight to g2, d4, knight f4, e3, queen f3, rook g8, so threatening the, uh, the f-pawn here because of the pin. King h1, d2, rook to e2. And, all right, this position is definitely unclear, but it at least looks like white has achieved a blockade for the moment. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that this is the best I can do. Maybe black can, or white can continue with rook to g2, um, and then queen to d2, e2, and then queen to d3, or queen to c4. Really just trying to lock up everything on the light squares. So instead, it seemed to me that e3 left my pawns less readily blockadable um, than, than d3 would. All right, well, his knight on h4 is loose if his queen doesn't go to g3. So that's, in fact, what he did. And now I played rook to g8, trying to open up some more tactical possibilities, like h5, maybe. Of course, knight to g6 check would be a problem right away, but just as an idea. And I am threatening to play rook takes f5. At least I think I am. Um, so he played rook to e2, and I'm trying to remember, why can't I play rook to uh, f5? Oh, no, no, I can't, of course. I'm just miscounting here. So rook takes f5, knight takes f5, queen f5, g takes f5, rook g3, and I'm just down a rook there. And my pawns aren't far enough advanced to, to justify that. But, but that's right. But So the point was, okay, yeah, if he plays knight to f3, then I have the capture on f5. So that's, that's really the idea. It's prophylaxis against knight f3. Okay, so um, rook to e2, rook e4. Again, possibilities of, of h5 in, in some circumstances. King h2, and now c4. So here come the pawns, b, c, d, c. And you can see these, these guys are running down the board a little bit. All right, so he plays knight to g2, which is, I think, a pretty good move. Uh, takes the knight from its exposed location, which also frees the white queen to move to, to some, some other place as as uh, circumstances warrant. And also, it just brings the knight back into the action. In some cases, it might go to f4. In some cases, he might want to just sacrifice the piece back with knight takes e3. So it's, it's a good move. All right, I played b5, continuing to do whatever I can with the uh, this massive majority. Knight to f4, and here I played queen to e5. Knight g2, queen f6, queen to c7. Okay, so now I played rook g to e8, preparing to play d3. So if he plays queen takes a7, um, then I can play d3 because, right, let me show you this. Okay, queen takes a7, d3, rook takes e3, and here though I have um, queen to e5 check. And after the king retreats, then I can play rook takes e3. And I'm regaining my piece, and of course... Uh, while the, the pawns are even in number, they're certainly not even in, in quality. My, mine are much faster here, and I'm probably winning in this position. So he played queen to c5, and um, hitting the d-pawn, hitting the b-pawn, and I decided at this point <coughs> that I didn't want his queen to bother my pawns any longer, and I played queen to e5 check. So we traded, and I should say at this point, I'm getting into time pressure, so I think I've probably got about four minutes left here, maybe a little bit less than that, and I think he had around nine or ten minutes to go before the end of the game. All right, well here I played, or he played knight to e1, so a good blockading move, and now I think I made, made some inaccuracies, so I again was too infatuated with my pawns, 
I should have played king to g7. So just centralizing my king, really helping to, uh, to blockade his pawns before they can do anything useful. And now I should be better, I believe, at this point. All right, so instead I played b4. He played king to g3. And again, I should probably play king to g7. And here I think white should bail out with the draw by giving up his knight for the pawns. So let's say h5, knight f4, takes, takes. And when I finally play d3, he sacks the piece. And this will just bottom out into a, a routine draw pretty much right away. All right. So instead of uh, king to g7, I played a5. If he played king to f3 here, I think the position's just equal. I mean, d3, he always just sacrifices the piece. So uh, Instead, he played f6. Now, I guess he was getting a bit optimistic. And actually, the, the, uh, the kind of ironic thing about this is it forced me to play what I should have been doing a while ago, namely activating my king. So king to g8, knight f3. Okay, and, and now um, he's got a double attack on my d-pawn. And uh, I made a mistake at this point. So this, this would have let him off the hook, or could have let him off the hook for a draw. So the right move here is d3, just ignoring his threat. Because if he takes the rook, um, I don't take his rook, but I play rook takes e5. And the, these hungry pawns can't be stopped. If uh, Probably white's best here is king to f3, but after takes, takes, and then b3, he can't, white can't successfully cope with the three passed pawns, and, and black is winning. If instead of um, playing knight takes rook, he tries rook e to e1, then simply e2 and c3, and again, there's, there's no stopping my pawns. So unfortunately, I played rook to d5, and here after knight to d2, I've got a, a little problem here, because uh, if e takes d2, he takes my rook, and if I move my rook away, he plays knight takes c4. Now, as it turns out, e takes d2 is fine, rook e4, c3. And in fact, in this position, I thought I was winning. But it looks as if white can actually use his rook to good effect. Go figure. An extra rook is useful. So rook to e2. And now uh, I could play just d3. And here white gives up, re returns the rook, and achieves essentially um, a drawn ending. So black has a you know, very minor advantage because I've got a little bit more space. You know, my king is a little bit um, is more, more advanced, my rook is slightly more active, my queenside majority is slightly more advanced, but still, this, this really ought to be a draw. So, you know, white, white still has to defend, black can press, but no real winning chances, I think, against accurate defense. Okay, uh, if instead of d3, black tries a4, trying to get all the pawns going here as fast as possible, then here too, white should give up his rook. And now we have a choice between a kind of a dull line and a, and a very interesting set of lines. So the dull line sees white, uh, sees black, sorry, capturing the rook. And um, here white's pieces are just in time. So b3 takes and takes, rook d2, rook b5, rook b2, let's say h6 to prevent um, g5 after king f7. But this is just a draw. Um, the, uh, the black kingside, queenside pawns are thoroughly blockaded. And see, the problem is, okay, just to continue this line a bit. So hg, hg, king g6, it'll sit with king to d3. And black can't make any progress without bringing his king over to the queenside. He can't do that as long as the pawns are around. And if he plays king takes g5, well, white just plays f7. And um, this, this is going to cause black to, to lose all of his stuff. So king takes d4, and obviously this is completely drawn. So that's the dull variation. Okay, if I just take the rook back on move 47 with c takes d2, king f4, and so on. So the more exciting line is b3, and so here it's it's uh, the the action continues. All right, so a b a b, and now rook takes d4 just loses immediately. That that's hopeless. But rook to e2 makes things very exciting, and in fact, the position is a draw now. So um, white um, has a number of threats, surprisingly enough, and, and they're, they're just in time. All right, so let's try the black, various black possibilities. Okay, so let's say we play d3. This certainly looks pretty, pretty natural. Rook to e7, and believe it, believe it or not, the position's a draw. 
And in fact, not all of my pawn pushes even allow me to save the draw. So this, this is actually a pretty cool position. This, this would be some work. So this isn't maybe a, a two-minute job here, but if you want to take the time, you know, I'd suggest um, pausing the recording here and see if you can figure out what black ought to play, or at least what, what moves are okay for black, and how white saves the game in, in each case. All right, so let's start with c2. This is, in fact, the worst move for, for black. After rook to a1, white wins. So rook to d8 is forced to stop rook to a8. Now rook to g7 check, king f8. Uh, king h8 will come to the same thing. Rook takes h7, and here white's just winning. So the point is, if it doesn't really matter, um, let's say b2 happens, white plays rook to a7, threatening rook to h8 mate, and on king to g8, rook a to g7, and rook a8 finishes the job. And pretty much everything is going to be some variation of that after uh, in this position. Okay, so c2 is actually losing. All right, if d2, here it's not losing, because if rook to a1, when black queens, the queen provides backup. So rook to a8, rook to d8, and black is winning. So f7 check is the right move, king f8, and now really remarkable continuation. I mean, it looks like the game is just over at this point, but with the remarkable rook to e8 check, king takes f7, and now rook e3. This is the only move that draws. It's crucial that, that white gains time with the threat of rook takes c3 when all the pawns are stopped. So black needs to play c2, and now rook to f1 check, and it's simply perpetual. So the king goes somewhere on the g file, g6, g7, g8, and the rook on e1 just goes wherever is appropriate to give check and just follows the, uh, the black king up and down. And notice that while black can avoid the perpetual by putting his king on g5, it avoids the perpetual at the, at the cost of getting checkmated by h4. So uh, king g5 is horrible, h4 will be mate. Okay, so that's a, a really remarkable draw. Now, what about b2? So b2 um, stops rook to a1 cold. Well, it turns out that white still has enough files to play with, and rook d to e1 draws. All right, so uh, first of all, if rook to d8, trying to prevent the draw, prevent the back rank check, here white wins. Rook g7, and um, whichever way he goes, he loses. So king f8, well, king h8 first, rook e to e7, and again, we've got the, the basic mate here, thanks to the pawn on f6. And if the king goes to f8, well, again, just rook takes h7. And, um, well, we already saw how this works. So the rook goes to e7, threatening rook to h8 mate. And then after king g8, rook e to g7, etc. Okay, so rook to d8's losing. Black has to push the d-pawn. And now white draws f7. Um, now, not king to g7, because rook f1 would actually win, threatening f8, which is, well, it's double check. That's the, the key point, winning. So king f8, rook e8, king f7, rook 8 to e7. And again, we just follow the king. Actually, the king has to go back to f8 or g8, because if he goes up to f6, again, he gets mated thanks to this. All right, so a very, very amusing line, and um, only a draw, though. All right, so that was rook to e2, d3, rook e7. I could also try rook to d7, trying to keep, uh, well, prevent f7 check and keep his rook off of e7. But here, too, white draws king f4, t3, again rook to e7. And um, if if I take, that's no good. Just takes, takes, king f7, rook d3, and um, white holds in that case. And if b2, rook d7, c2, f7, king here, check, check, and now this. And... Um, of course, now white doesn't have to worry too much because black is, is running out of pawns a little bit. He needs to play c1 or, or b1. Um, and this looks actually pretty good at first because it's queen with check. The problem is white now checks, and after king f7, rook d7. And once again, the rook on the d file will shadow the king on the f file, or wherever it goes. So he just, just follows it, and um, it's another unavoidable perpetual check. So this, this would not have been easy at all for for Udasin to have found. I mean, he was getting fairly short of time himself. 
And, um, you know, for all I know, I would have blown it, too. I mean, it's rapid game. Anything could have happened. Instead, he played rook to f1, which is another aggressive try, but, but this one doesn't work. So I played rook to d8, preventing f7 and rook to e8. He plays rook to e2. I played d3. And now, with the loss of two tempi here for white, rook takes on d2 is, is just not good enough. So cd, rook d1, rook c8, rook d2. And now black has the nice move rook to, d2, uh, rook to c2, with the first point that if rook takes d3, rook to c3 just wins. Black is going to queen on, on uh, one of his pawns on the queen side before the, uh, the white king can, can make it over. So rook to d1 is forced. Rook takes a2, king f4, d2, king e3, a4, takes, and now b3. And um, the pawns are just in time again before um, blacks, oh sorry, before white's king can make it all the way over. So an interesting try is rook to d8 followed by rook to b8, but after b2, king f4, uh, king to d, d2 is impossible because b1 queen is discovered check, and otherwise uh, just a3, rook a1, and so on. So king f4, going for, for a counterattack, a3, king e5, rook a1, rook b7, king g6. And although my king looks like it's in big danger, there's no way for white to exploit this. So, uh, for example, if we're to g7 and then g5, king h5. And now, again, he's just one move away from winning. So if his king was on f4 or f5, rook takes h7 would, um, would at least give him perpetual. Well, perpetual if his king's on f4, mate if his king is on f5. But he doesn't have time to bring the king over. If uh, king to f4, rook to f1 check, or if king to f5, b1 queen check is even better. All right. That leaves just rook takes h7, but after king to g5, it's, it's apparent that my king will escape perpetual check quite easily. All right, but this is perhaps the best try that he had. In the game, after d3, he played rook e to f2. And here I just, from, from here on out, I basically just ignore what he's up to, and I get my pawns going. So a4, uh, again, rook takes d2 is going to be too slow for reasons that pretty much go along with what we just saw. So g5, b3, takes and takes, h4, b2, h5, and now c2. And, I mean, this is this is pretty rare. I mean, you're not going to find many games, even if you look through all the databases, you'll maybe find two or three games with, with um, this many passed pawns about to queen. So very, very rare, as well, especially with the, the backup pawn on z3. So... Uh, the three connected passers on the seventh rank is, is very rare already, and with the uh, the backup pawn there, it's it's even more more unusual. And uh, fortunately, it's not just that they're uh, very attractive and uh, and dangerous, but I'm I'm in time before his uh, his own kingside play takes effect. So um, here he played rook takes d2, getting rid of one of them, but at last I queen one of these pawns. Okay, so now I'm finally relieved. I've queened a pawn. I'm, I'm very short of time, but I have enough. He played rook d to d1. And here, okay, I, I should have probably played queen takes g5, but, you know, serious time trouble. I played queen to e3. And now he helped me along with king to g4. So his king should go backwards. I'm still winning, of course, and, and winning pretty handily with rook to d4. But still, um, now it's just mate. Rook to d4 check, king to f5. Queen e4 mate, and so that was the end of the game. And I was definitely very excited about this. Udawson was definitely the strongest player I had beaten in a tournament game up to that point, and uh, probably still up to this point, as, as a matter of fact, as well. I mean, he's quite a strong player. Um, and just, you know, to, to have this experience where I had no real hopes for the, uh, for the game at all. I mean, first of all, I didn't expect to play, and I, I certainly didn't expect to play well. And then to have black against the, the, the strongest player in the event, or at least the highest rated player in the event, and to win was just a wonderful surprise. So uh, this was definitely one of my happiest memories in, in chess, even though it, it didn't, didn't win any, any uh, money for me. There was no, no title, no nothing, just a nice surprise win against a, a very strong grandmaster. So a very enjoyable moment uh, for me. And... Um, you know, definitely, it was definitely a great, great propaganda for uh, for my lesson. So, you know, I went back to the chess camp the next day, and I could say, hey, kids, you know, you should listen to me. Here's what I did against uh, a very good player. So I was a bit lucky, I would say. I mean, he missed um, missed a, a, a fairly clear 
um, way to have a winning position early on in the middle game. But still, you know, sometimes you need to have a little luck, and uh, and I got it in this in this game. So I hope you enjoy this game. Um, thanks a lot for for watching. Um, if you like this, check out my blog, chessmind.powerblogs.com. Always got to throw in that plug there. And um, next week, I think I'm back to another U.S. Chess League countdown show. So check that out. I'll uh, be summarizing three games in, in the one show. And um, after that, I think it'll be time for another one of my own games. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, you know, let me know what you think about this. And uh, I'll see you again with a new show next week. Take care. Bye-bye.